So we're back in Daniel 7. We uh, cut off on Daniel 7 and we're filling the second part of the two part here. Um, can someone read? There's gonna, a couple verses I want us to, to look at just to familiarize ourselves uh, with a, a few New Testament verses. Uh, if someone could get John 12:34, and if someone could get Mark 14, 61, and 62. You want John 12, 34, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then Mark. You want to do it? Mark 14, 61, and 62. Um, because I think I mentioned last time that Son of Man, the Son of Man, is Jesus' favorite self designation. It's the one he uses speaking of himself. And really, you don't see in the Gospels anyone besides Jesus identifying himself that way with one kind of exception, which is the verse Danny uh, is going to have, which is they're calling him that, recognizing this, the connection between Son of Man and Messiah, because Jesus called himself that and said that the Son of Man is going to be lifted up, which is a euphemism for crucifixion. And this is a problem for them, understandably somewhat, because there's new revelation being given in the time of Jesus, is a problem because they're understanding the one like a son of man to come and reign over the nations forever as the Messiah, and but they're not getting that he has to, to die and be lifted up, um, which is in Daniel as well. So they you know, arguably should have, but uh, anyway, but Jesus calls himself this and it's all, and it's usually in the context of his uh, his mission. You know, the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man uh, did not come to serve, uh, did not come to be served, but to serve. Uh, so a lot of those contexts. But I wanted to read a couple uh, of those verses before we kind of get back into understanding what's the background to this. And Jesus calls himself uniquely the son of man which is not a you know not the title here it's one like the son of man here but he identifies himself as that particular you know son of man i am the one um so uh danny if you could read john 12 34 people answered him we have heard from the law that the christ remains forever and how can you say the son of man must be lifted up who is the son of man Okay, so they said, now their problem there is that Jesus said he was going to be lifted up, and they connect Son of Man very clearly with the term the Christ. So it's obvious they believe the Christ and the Son of Man to be uh, the Messiah who was going to come and reign forever. And they're right, but they're missing the fact that of the Son of Man's uh, suffering. And then kind of a climactic or aclimactic verse uh, in Mark um, is the one Melissa has. So when Jesus is on trial the night before he's crucified, they have a, a kind of heresy trial for Jesus to try to coax him into saying something for which they can put him to death. They have an illegal trial, um, but they, they finally get kind of something that they can go off of um, and they ask him, you know, are you the son of God? Are you the son of the blessed one? And uh, so, Melissa, do you want to go ahead and read that one? Are you ready? Uh, so, 61 says, But he kept silent and did not answer anything. Again, the high priest questioned him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and all of you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Right. So... Jesus quotes, and then they, they respond, Mark 14, 63, 64, that this is blasphemy, and they, they can now ask for Jesus to be crucified. Uh, they could have stoned him, but they want him to be uh, crucified by Roman crucifixion as a cursed death, and for other reasons as well. But anyway, uh, so they have, uh, they ask Jesus, are you the son of the blessed one, the Messiah? So they're, they're connecting these terms together. And then he says, he quotes at least, I count there a couple of them, um, in Mark 14, 62, uh, scriptures he puts together. Um, number one, he says, I am, which is not just in John, this is God's self-designation. 
I am, and you will see uh, the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power at Psalm 110, 1, that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then, probably most importantly, he pulls all those scriptures together in kind of the background of, and you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. And they understood only God comes with the clouds. Um, so they, they're understanding Jesus is identifying himself as the, the divine Messiah, um, which he was and is, but they, they rejected that. Uh, so Jesus uses this, and we're seeing even more just the contrast between the picture of the Son of Man in Daniel 7 and Jesus' ministry, because he's fulfilling that uh, suffering part of his ministry. But anyway, that's just to kind of get our minds ready to kind of go back to the Old Testament and see, okay, what's the background of this? Uh, so that we can understand those, those texts and other places where Jesus is calling himself the Son of Man even better. Uh, some questions I want us to think about for tonight, just to, for us to, throughout, to uh, examine is number one, because this is a text that's going to, a uh, word that's going to come up a lot in the text, is the word saint. What does it mean, not just technically, but also practically, what does it mean to be a saint? We'll talk about that in just a second. What is the definition of a saint? What is that uh, what is the anatomy of a saint? If we had to talk about what that, you know, what a saint looks like, uh, or what defines a saint, and, and then how to live as one, uh, because that's what the believers in Daniel seven are called, and they give us, you know, some I think some really uh, applicational things. Like Danny said last week, this is very much a behold chapter where we see Christ, we see God as He is, but we. We also take from that, you know, okay, there are, there are implications for how we're, we're to think and, uh, and to worship and to live from there. It's not, the text is not about us. Uh, it's about Christ. But there, I, I think there is, uh, I even underestimated how much, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, application that we can draw from this as well. Um, so what does it mean to be a saint? And so we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, some other questions just to think about more applicationally, is what makes us long for this event? Or on the reverse side, what hinders us for, from wanting this to, to happen? Could, you know, could be lots of things. It doesn't have to be necessarily real moral failings. It just can be, okay, well, taking it for granted or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, what, how do we connect this future event with us now? What's, how do we live in light of that? Uh, those things. Uh, but let's talk about first, before we jump back in to our main text in Daniel 7, let's talk about what it means to be a saint um, and what, you know, what a saint looks like, what, you know, what's the definition a little bit. And again, I'm not looking for uh, some particular answer for you to guess what I'm thinking. I'm just looking for some, some thought and discussion that we can kind of put some things together as we walk through this chapter. So what do you guys think? What does it mean to be a saint? I think it, especially as I've been studying for Daniel, I think it reflects as well throughout scripture. It's a saint as a person, or a saint's a group of people that are, that are in a separate category in some measure, some degree. <clears throat> separate category, but I suppose just to focus in separate a separate people, separate person in some fashion. Yeah, separateness, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, what else? Saint, well, either, what does it mean? You can talk about, I don't mean to individualize it too much, but what does it mean for you as a, you know, as you think, of, okay, my identity as a saint in Christ, what does that mean for me? Or it could be a little bit more like, okay, separateness, you know, something as simple as that. Uh, what do you guys think? or think of verses that apply to it or anything like that? Um, I usually think of, you know, because of the, the word sanctified, you know, set apart, but um, when I think of saint, I think of, like, someone held to, a, to God's standard, or not only held to that standard, but also empowered to that standard. So, um, you know, someone whose life, you know, looks uh, more like God than than a, 
to someone who isn't a snake. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Any other thoughts on that? Sink? Thanks. So, I was uh, bleeding into the New Testament. It's interesting that the whole everyone is called, even based on what Kevin was saying, to everyone's called the same. It's just kind of crazy. It's like, well, yeah. how does that bother? I mean, positionally there, but yeah. more and more we are called as saints, more and more we reflect you know, what Kevin was saying. Right. We are in the image of Christ. Yeah, the Holy Ones in the image of Christ. Yeah, though, that's. Great, yeah, great definitions, and it's it's probably the most, I don't want to say when I'm not sure, but it is one of the most common terms for believers, especially by Paul, because I think Paul is taking so much from Daniel 7. I think he realizes on the Damascus Road that Jesus of Nazareth is the one like a son of man, and then that means the saints, he's been you know, persecuting Christ, and he's been persecuting the saints. So he's on the wrong side of God. Um, and that's why he has such a dramatic shift over. And, and also what Paul, you know, what his commitments are as far as you know, other things that we'll see uh, tonight. But yeah, saints, holy ones, that, that is a, a paradigm shift for a lot of people. I know for us, we know the definition of saint in a general way. But also just, I've, I've had conversations with people um, who have said, oh, well, the saints, this, and I'm like, what do you mean by a saint? And they're like, well, this, and I'm like, no, I said, all, all believers are saints. Oh, well, where do you get that from? Ephesians 1, 2, you know, <laughs> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the saints at Ephesus. I'm like, this is not a, um, it is a special term, but it is also, a, it is a general term for believers. Uh, you know, even on the Old Testament, uh, and he said you had uh, uh, Psalm 16, you memorized at one point, right? The, for the saints who are in the earth, right? They're uh, the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. You know, so it's, this is a word that is, uh, yeah, applied to believers, Old Testament and New Testament. But I want us to kind of see that tonight a little bit in, in this time, between Daniel 7, the, the vision of Daniel 7 has not occurred in history yet. Heaven has, the statement I always make that, Melissa, like, that heaven has not broken loose on earth yet. It's uh, all heaven hasn't broken loose on earth yet in uh, Jesus reigning and his kingdom unfolded this way quite yet. It's going to. Everything that's needful for it to happen, besides God's timing, is, is already accomplished. But this hasn't happened yet. But how do we live between where we are now until this, this happens? Is kind of what we you know need to uh, consider. So we'll look at that. That'll kind of be the reoccurring question tonight. Is reoccurring the word? It's recurring, right? Or can you say both? Reoccurring. Because occurring, I mean, it makes recurring. sense. But anyway. Yeah, I think it's recurring. <laughs> okay, because it's like I have a reoccurring dream. I think yeah. it's recurring. I think repeated is a pretty good book. <laughs> anyway. It's like a yeah. effect, an effect, just say impact. Okay. Impact. I, I don't know the right answer, but I'm smart enough to know that I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I recognize that I may have said something weird. Okay. So let's get back into Daniel 7.13 and see, again, I'll read 7.13 and 14, but also see uh, some things about here. What does it mean to be a saint? So it's also looking at Christ, but then the implications for uh, the saints, which are the word Daniel uses several times here. But let me read verses 13, 14 for us. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, uh, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So there's the you know, kind of poetic statement about the, the Son of Man that's kind of brought down uh, into the, those two verses. Pretty simple, but it's, it's also pretty uh, dense. But I, I would say that... Uh, 
you know, trajecting forward to, to New Testament theology, um, the saints are in this one as the, the one like a son of man as the second Adam. So I would say, I would add that, and this is kind of an outline, it's not, it wasn't as detailed as my outline, but the saints are in, in the second Adam, uh, and they focus on the supremacy of Christ. That's what I would identify there. We've, we talked last time about how this uh, connects with a lot of other texts that shows that the one here is the second Adam. He's one like a son of man. He's man. He's son of man. He has a resemblance and he has a similarity to man, but there's something that's dissimilar and where he's totally different. And that's where the word like comes in. It's important. Like man is in the image and the likeness of God, but now we here we have kind of the mirror image. God is in the likeness of man. And we have God appearing in human form. We have the, the image of the invisible God here. Uh, God in the flesh. And that unlike all other previous people in Adam who tried to rule the world, who tried to succeed, who tried to take dominion over the earth in a sinful and rebellious way, they all failed. This one actually succeeds. And, and he actually has a right to it as the, the second Adam. Um, and he reigns totally supreme. He also accepts uh, worship as uh, we're going to see. So, you know, Paul, let me tie this to some other uh, places in the New Testament just to see, okay, well, how, does, how, does, how do we take this into kind of our time as New Covenant, New Testament, uh, Gentile believers in the 21st century? Well, think about, um, and you could probably find more, but think about like Colossians 1. And I talked about this a little bit when we were having some of our discussion last week. But Colossians 1, Paul is, Colossians is all about the supremacy of Christ. Um, you have Ephesians and Colossians. Ephesians is more about the position of the church, the, the church of the Christ. Uh, Colossians is kind of the equal opposite, the Christ of the church. And Colossians pulls, Paul is pulling from the theology of Daniel 7, understanding that that's, Jesus of Nazareth, that he is the, the Messiah. And you get this from, I mean, Colossians 1, 2, 4, 12, 26. I mean, don't worry about you know, getting all the details, but he calls them saints all throughout. Uh, he talks about the transferring of the believers from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Here we have the kingdom transferred into the one like a son of man, who is also the son of God. Uh, we have the image, as I said, Colossians 1.15, the image of the invisible God, or the likeness of the invisible God. And here we have both the Ancient of Days, God the Father, portrayed like a man, and we also have uh, the one like a son of man, portrayed in human form as well. And so we now see the image of the invisible God, the one who is that perfect uh, image. The, he's called the firstborn of all creation, Daniel 7. He's the, the Lord of all creation. Um, also, the use of the word thrones. Here is God pictured in his court, his throne room, where there's a bunch of thrones, but the central one is, and, and most important one, is God's throne, and a second throne is set up next to him. And in Colossians 1, he talks about now Christ is above all thrones and all powers and all authorities because he's reigning next to uh, the Ancient of Days, God the Father. Uh, he also talks about dominions. Daniel 7.27 talks about dominion was taken away from all the kingdoms of earth. So you can see how this bleeds into uh, Paul's uh, theology and also how he uh, takes that and shows this is, this is what we're about. This is this vision is definitional for what it means to be a saint. It's the, about the supremacy of Christ. It's about the fact that he is the second Adam, uh, that we're in him. He's given universal authority. Uh, and then also the Gentiles here join themselves to the Lord through the one like Son of Man. And Paul says his mission is uniquely to the Gentiles because for Paul, the eschatological future was starting to kind of come into the present. That Paul's job is in his mission is kind of to prepare for 
this event and to, in his way, in the economy of God, preach the gospel so that the world is moving on its trajectory toward this happening. Um, lots of other scriptures, you know, come into mind. Uh, Romans 5, which talks about Christ as the, you know, in Adam all die, in Christ uh, all are made alive. Except in Christ, he brings more than Adam lost. He brings, he doesn't just restore what Adam forfeited through sin. He brings it back and brings uh, total eternal life and that can bring about resurrection of the dead, all these things that can happen. Uh, so he doesn't just switch back and revert back. Kind of interesting as well. This is kind of a side note. But in, if you trace the ending of Revelation, where Satan comes back as a uh, dragon to try to tempt the nations, it's starting to look kind of like Eden, but then he's released to kind of tempt the nations and stuff. It's kind of like a repeat of uh, the Garden of Eden, except now you have the Son of Man reigning. And he, as the second Adam, the perfect Adam, he does not fail like Adam failed. And, and Satan's totally destroyed, as we see here in Daniel 7 as well. Um, there's also kind of a royal significance to this, uh, you know, connected with David in uh, David's promised an eternal kingdom as well. He's promised that there will someone be on your throne and it'll be an everlasting throne. Um, in 2 Samuel 7, uh, places like Psalm 2. Uh, but let me read a section of Psalm 8-4. A few years ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, when we were here, we were choosing different psalms. I remember teaching on Psalm 8. Let me read Psalm 8, 4 through 6. It says, What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? So it's talking about man generally, that well, man and the son of man is kind of, you know, why should God care? But talks about in verse 5, and you have made him a little lower than God. You made, uh, you have crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands and you put all things under his feet. And so it's talking about, well, man is in comparison and contrast to God insignificant, but man's made to rule and God does intend to bring that about. And so as David's reflecting on that, he says, well, man is made to rule over creation and have those things under his feet. And remember in Psalm 110, like he's gonna, uh, his enemies are going to be made a footstool for his feet, for when talking about Messiah. Uh, and man is to rule. And in 1 Corinthians 15, when it talks about the resurrection, it says Christ is going to reign, where it talks about him being the second Adam as well. He's going to rule until all things are under his feet. And so you can even hear in Psalm 8, 4, that language of, Man, son of man. Well, this one is one like a son of man, except he's uh, different in that he succeeds in everything that Adam fails in because he has total authority and total power to do those things. Um, but in order to do that, let me let's project ahead a little bit in Daniel. Messiah does have to suffer. And you see that here between the connection between the saints who suffer and how closely tied they are with the Son of Man. It says there's even almost interchangeable language sometimes where it says the Son of Man receives a kingdom. Later on, we're going to see the saints receive the kingdom. Well, they receive the kingdom because they're connected with the Son of Man as their representative. But the Son of Man has to as Danny read in the, uh, John 12, 34, be lifted up. Uh, can someone read uh, two verses here? Daniel 9, 26, and then maybe someone else read Daniel 12, 2. 9, 26, and 12, 2. Okay, 9, 26. And somebody else want to 12, 2. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, uh, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Yeah. So, what does it say there is going to happen to the Messiah? Hmm. 
right? It's going to be cut off after 62 weeks. So it even gives us a time frame. Now there's some disagreement on that, you know, between believing people, but there's a, a time frame for when the Messiah will be cut off. Um, Daniel probably is also reflecting on Isaiah 53, where he was cut off for the transgress. who considered that he would be cut off for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due. Cut off means to be dead, to be killed, uh, or even executed in that sense. That you're, there's a judicial kind of idea with it as well. So the Messiah, also the Son of Man, in Daniel, is talked about being cut off, and there's even a timetable for it before the destruction of the temple. So there's a, there's a limit placed on you know, when Messiah would come. Uh, but... Isaiah 53 references this as well, but uh, Kenton, if you could read Daniel 12, 2. Daniel 12, 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Yeah. So the saints there, so it, tell, it talks about a lot of the saints are going to get killed, but there's going to be a resurrection, or they're going to die of you know, natural causes, unless they're present when this event unfolds on the earth. It's going to be, you know, smaller group out of the believing people. And so they're going to be resurrected. The uh, thing here is the saints and the Son of Man are so connected that the resurrection of the saints later on talked about in Daniel 12 pretty much presupposes that, the, that after Messiah died, he resurrected too. Mm. That the, the saints died in him and that uh, when he was cut off, and that they are resurrected because he was resurrected. And so there's this, this real close uh, connection between the saints and his, and his people. And also, you know, you can walk your way through the New Testament and see this, but I, I thought of, you know, Galatians 2.20, Paul talks about, I've been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And, you know, you're just going back and forth on that, um, you know, talking about those, those themes. Uh, but anyway, that's just a little bit of a Old Testament, I will say, apologetic that talks about glorious coming of the Son of Man, but also the inclusion of his, his death at a certain time and his resurrection that will bring about the resurrection of his people as well. Um, but, let's look at the next part here, uh, in being a saint in verse 14, which we've already read, but I want us to notice a particular word there, which I mentioned last time, so this is a little bit unusual and shows the distinction in Jesus' first coming, it's the word serve. So remember Mark 10, 45, Mark's all about Jesus being the servant, and uh, Matthew references this as well in Matthew 20, 28, and... I, I say it wrong a lot of the time because it's easy to mess, miss up that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Um, that's a great gospel verse, by the way, just to preach uh, one sermon out of or even a short evangelistic sermon out of because it's very, it talks about the nature of who Jesus is, giving his life as a ransom for many, you know, so it's a... It's a good scripture for those purposes as well. So that kind of shows Jesus' distinction that this time he's coming as the servant. You know, he is still the servant of God to carry forward God's plan to completion, but uh, that's what his role was and his, his mission was in that time. But I also want us to notice that everyone, all peoples, nations, and languages are going to serve him. Uh, do we have any other translations here for verse 14? A lot of us may be using the New American Standard, but if someone's using something else. For serving? Yeah. He says serve. Okay. Serve is the right word. It's just there can be a little bit of different meaning. Do you have New King James? Serve? Serve? Do you have a ESV? Okay. Then serve is right, so never mind. But... Uh, <laughs> Serve can also be a word, uh, another word for worship, reverence, worship, um, and we'll look at some verses that'll that'll prove that, it'll bear that out in Daniel a little bit. It's also used in uh, verse 27. Everyone's going to serve 
him. And he calls him the highest one uh, or the most high. But the idea here is what one serves, one worships. And it's not just like doing service like you go, you know, serve someone from church. This is uh, devotional or religious worshipful service to someone. It's even talked about in Ezra 7.24 is the Levites are temple servants, kind of the same idea there, that they're servants performing a uh, cultic religious service for God. Uh, and now it says all the nations are going to come and serve this king, the one like the son of man. Uh, let me read a few verses or reference a few verses that talk about, uh, talk about this, this word. Well, actually, well, this will be a little, don't feel pressure, but it, it's just for fun. Are any guesses as to where we see this context either serve or worship coming up in the book of Daniel before? Uh, when Nebuchadnezzar builds his statue? Golden statue. He wants them, everybody to serve the golden statue. So it's not just service like you do a king because the three men say no. So <laughs> it's connected with worship. So that's definitely one. Yeah, how come you're not serving? How come you're not worshiping my statue? Okay, so that's one. Let me see what I'm yeah, the golden image, and then also it's another kind of similar context. Is Belshazzar, is there one? Uh, not Belshazzar, a little later. Darius? Darius wants everybody to, yeah, kind of, uh, to, to worship him, let me, yeah, to worship him uh, and, and only serve him. So let me re give you these references, okay, serve and uh, worship show up together. Uh, this is what Kenton pointed out, the uh, Daniel three twelve, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't serve, uh, it says, These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the, uh, the golden image which you have set up. So see, a serve and worship, uh, Daniel three twelve are kind of put together as a similar idea. Now, you guys can serve each other, you can serve me, you can serve someone at church, you do serve that's not the same type of thing, this type of service is one that the faithful refuse to do to anybody but God, so it would have been idolatry for them to bow down and do service to Nebuchadnezzar, the service to the statue like this uh, Daniel 3.14 Nebuchadnezzar asks uh, is it true uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up, uh, Daniel three seventeen and eighteen, in seventeen and eighteen, so you can separate it there, a little comma, uh, if you want to remember it that way. Uh, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and He will deliver us out of the hand of out of your hand, O King. But even if He does not, let it be known to you, O King that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So notice they say we serve God, but we will not serve your gods or worship this uh, image. So uh, Daniel 3, 38, Nebuchadnezzar responded, uh, and he's talking to them, talks about uh, that they violated the king's command and yielded up their bodies so as to serve so as not to serve and worship any god except their own god. This is when Nebuchadnezzar's recognizing, hey, they survived. Uh, what's going on here? They've got a really powerful god. And he says, this is, they didn't serve or worship my gods, and they refused to do it except to their own god. Uh, Daniel 6.16, 6, this is years later with, with Darius or Cyrus. Uh, Your god whom you constantly serve. This is Darius as he's about to put Daniel into the lion's den. Your God whom you constantly serve will deliver you. Daniel 6.20 uh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Okay, and then the last two are 7.14 and 7.27. It talks about now remember, this is not legitimate to give to anybody except God. But now all the nations are coming and bowing down and serving this one. And God is, the Ancient of Days is 
giving this one the kingdom. He is, uh, thinks it's appropriate. It's not a threat. It's not a competition. You know, it's kind of like, there's some pretty bold language that's used of Jesus. Philippians 2, you know, it's talking about him being the servant and all that stuff. But it also talks about that did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, clung to, uh, but made himself a servant. And then God highly exalted him and that everyone's going to bow to him and every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus is Lord uh, to the glory of God the Father. So it's not an insult to God. It's not a competition with God. It's uh, that this is the one who shares divine identity with God that God establishes for the world to worship. That God's accomplished all these things um, in his son. Um, and so he actually receives glory from people worshiping this one. So it's, you know, it's definitely appropriate for us to worship Jesus, and it's actually demanded. The whole world's going to uh, do it at some point, going to be required to serve the one like a son of man. Every, as it says here, all the peoples, nations, of uh, every language. So let's bring together all the Gentile uh, nations of the world are going to uh, worship this figure, you know, so this is pretty uh, unique. This is a unique position that this person, this individual holds. Um, so to be a saint, you know, it's also to be a worshiper. You know, what does it mean to be a saint? It's that we, uh, that's what Paul's talking about in Colossians 1. It's this, the focusing on the supremacy of Christ, that we follow this now. We serve him now, just like Daniel. You know, your God whom you constantly serve, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their God that they serve, but they wouldn't serve other gods. Um, and that makes that distinction. That there's that unique, worshipful attention to, to God. And for us, God in Christ. Uh, let's look a little bit closer, even at um, verse 14, that what does it mean to be a saint? In, in other terms, it means that we have a... Uh, new humanity, that there's a new humanity in this one as a second Adam. Uh, I'll go over this quickly, but uh, people's languages, nations are worshiping this one. Remember that before the other kings were trying to get all the people's nations and languages to worship them, or the golden statue, or those type of things. And you know, now, and then other times where you see that phrase, people's, nations, languages, um, it's often in places where Nebuchadnezzar is saying, hey, listen, everybody, of every people, nation, and language, the God of Israel is the one true God. Or uh, Darius, same thing. Now I know your God is the God of gods. You know, that listen, every people, tongue, and language, this is, uh, this is the real God. Uh, this is the one who's the greatest, the highest one. Um, and so it's put in a lot of those, those different contexts that ultimately the one like a son of man is actually able to reign over them and he's not dethroned like all these other kings. Uh, his kingdom lasts forever and is not destroyed. Um, notice here in verses... Uh, 18, 21, 22, 25, 27, the word saints are used. Okay, in Daniel's time, that's, that's, we're Jewish. But also, verse 14, all the nations come. This is a, a new humanity in this, this individual. Now, we've got to move forward. There are a lot of New Testament verses we could look at that talk about that we're all one in Christ. That there's no distinction between Jew or Gentile. In fact, there's no distinctions as far as identity anymore, that we're all one in Christ, that we're all a new, one new man in Christ Jesus, as it talks about in Ephesians 1 and 2. You know, this is all over. Um, but we do need to move, uh, move forward and talk a little bit more about Daniel's uh, interpretation of vision, what it means to be a saint. But let's uh, read verses... I know that's a lot of setup, but let's it, <laughs> let's read through verses um, 15 through 18. You may see there the paragraph breaks. We'll just kind of break it down that way. 
Um, as for me, Daniel, so what's Daniel's reaction? This is a great vision, but it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of an unexpected reaction. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me. Uh, and the visions of my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by, so an angel that's going to interpret it for him, and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, uh, these great beasts are four in number, and four kings will arise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, uh, for all ages to come. So the saints, so part of being a saint is, is victory for the saints. Victory means a reception of the kingdom because they are in the Son of Man. They are in Christ. Because he receives a kingdom, we receive a kingdom. The technical kind of term for this it's not, not real confusing to understand what it means. Is, is called corporate solidarity. We had corporate solidarity with Adam. We're all human, humankind. In Adam, we, we bear that legacy. We all sin. We all die. Uh, in Christ as the second Adam, he's our representative. What he accomplishes and what he does benefits and applies to us. So even though... We didn't die on a cross for our sins. We didn't resurrect from the dead. We can say, because he's our representative of a new humanity, and we're in him by faith in Christ and our union with him, uh, like Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So there's a distinction we are not Christ, we don't receive worship, but we do receive the benefits of what he did in his kingdom. Think about even uh, David and Goliath. And we are not David. You know, the, the message from that is not to, okay, well, you know, what are the five stones in your life to take down the Goliaths? You know, what, do you, what are the five stones you need to take down the Goliaths in your life? That's, that's a bad, uh, weak sermon that I'm sure many, you know, Godly, Bible-believing people preach, but they just have missed, missed the point of the text. But what we do see there is, is the idea of a, kind of a representative champion. David beats Goliath, but they're the only two fighting. But you also have... Uh, Kenton, can you click on there? It, my, I'm getting a low battery warning. So just the close. Okay, still got Chris. It's also appropriate to say that Israel beat the Philistines. Well, Israel and the Philistines didn't even fight. Just David and Goliath did. So it's, they're represented in their individual, their chosen person. So that's kind of how it is with, with us in Christ, uh, or us in Adam. We're either in Adam or we're in Christ. And Adam's legacy is sin and death. Sin, uh, Christ's legacy is uh, salvation, grace, in eternal life, resurrection from the dead. Um, so there's victory for the saints. So as we see here, Daniel, he's pretty upset. Verse 15, he, the angel tells him there's victory. And it also ends, the chapter ends, verse 27, or 28, um, ends with Daniel being distressed. Daniel's frightened. He is uh, concerned. Uh, He's disturbed by this vision because, you know why? It's all, a lot of it is great stuff. It shows the, the glorious end of the ruling of the Son of Man forever. Well, why is he so upset? Well, because he knows until that time, there, and the time we're in now, there's an intermediary time where all the kingdoms of the world are going to be against God. They're going to be sinful, rebellious kingdoms against God. Now there may be some individual exceptions where there are some people, not a, certainly not all people are against God, but 
all world forces and kingdoms are going to in some way be opposed to God and his kingdom. And to varying degrees, there's going to be uh, hardship for the saints. And that's what Daniel sees. Really up until the very end where evil culminates and is quickly destroyed by God, this is the human condition. This is what they'll continue to pursue until the very end. And so this is a, a disturbing vision in a sense. And I think Daniel's sadness, I think Daniel's alarm is actually pretty instructive for us as well. Because I think um, we can apply it in the way that Daniel did. He's writing to a people in exile and, and we're a people in exile. Now there are Reformed, Bible-believing, Presbyterian friends who don't believe that, who believe Christ is reigning right now, we should be preaching the gospel and that will kind of allow a, a not a military political, but kind of a takeover of the earth. I don't think that's how the Daniel views it. I don't think that's how the New Testament views it. I think we're, we're put squarely in that context of exile, that between now and this event, we're living in this time of exile where the kingdoms that we're going to live under are going to be in some general way and in some degrees uh, against the kingdom of God. And that that's going to entail suffering for the saints. Um, and in the broadest way, I think suffering is defined, now none of us would say, hey, like, are you suffering right now? Maybe somebody, but it, it, probably not in a lot of senses. But I think suffering in its broadest sense is whatever hardships we as saints experience in the world that make us realize that we live in a time that is not the kingdom of God, totally unfolded as it should be, and that make us long for that event. I think that's it. I think that's all that suffering is. It can just be a feeling of sadness about the way the world is right now because of sin, because of rebellion against God, because of opposition to Christ and God's kingdom, that whatever makes us feel that is in the broadest sense, at least as I'm defining now, as suffering. Now, sometimes suffering is a lot more severe than that. The Christians in China right now are under a more severe persecution where people are actively going against Christianity, you know, from a, a communist government. Okay, that's one aspect of it. But also, Daniel is experiencing, along with the people around him, a lot of people are enjoying Babylon and just getting very comfortable. And he knows that they shouldn't be, and he knows that he shouldn't be. And so this is, you know, this is hard for him. There's a, a temptation to worldliness during this time that's, uh, that's saddening him as well. And so that's that suffering is to make us realize, hey, wait a second, this is not the world as it's meant to be. We're supposed to be looking forward to verses 13 and 14, not our temptation to get very comfortable in the way that the world system is now. Nothing wrong with comfort, nothing wrong with air conditioning. It's, you know, it's not a monastic thing. It's just, this is the way the world is and being cool with it and contented with it. Um, I think Daniel is, is indicating to us that that's not uh, the focus we're supposed to have. And, and so that's an application question we'll, we'll circle back to at the end. But thinking about, you know, what makes us long for leaving the world as it is to enter this event? That doesn't have to mean through death, but just for longing for this event to happen. What encourages us to long for that? And then what are some things that make us pretty comfortable, you know, attitudes or just mindsets, it's easy to adopt. But we'll, we'll circle back to that. But Daniel's told that there will ultimately be victory for the saints. But listen to um, verse 19 through uh, 22 here, the type of suffering that's going to be entailed. It says, then I desire to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast. So Daniel wants to see what's going to happen. This ultimate kingdom 
that embodies the satanic activity uh, of opposition against God that will target the, they can't target God, so they'll target God's people. What's that going to look like? Uh, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful from all the others uh, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze and which devoured and crushed down the remainder with its feet. The meaning of the ten horns which were on its head, which came up, and before, them, uh, before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, which was larger in appearance than the, its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So again, suffering, kingdom delay, then victory. But in between, the saints and are going to suffer. They're suffering now. They've suffered for years, and they're going to suffer until this happens. And this is one of the reasons why Paul uh, and other New Testament writers, but I'd say especially Paul, talks about suffering so much. Because it's a necessity in Christian uh, ministry. And when the Thessalonians in their culture are thinking, gosh, we are suffering so much. Does God hate us? Have we entered the day of the Lord? Have we missed the, the glorious coming of Christ? Are we being judged? And Paul's saying, no, no, no. Suffering is a plain indication that you are, uh, that you're suffering. God's people have always suffered. They, people have always persecuted the prophets. They persecuted the Lord Jesus. They persecute us as the apostles. And now they're persecuting you. So it's not, uh, suffering is not a disqualifier. In fact, it is in some ways a, a qualifier of, of what's going to happen uh, to the saints. And, you know, so he's building out of that, you know, their theology that we're going to, uh, going to suffer. And again, keep a broad idea of what suffering means. It's, gonna, it's not always like you're shipwrecked or someone's persecuting you or going to execute you for being a Christian. It's everything that's the pressure of this world system that makes us long for uh, the vision of Daniel 7. Uh, you know, there's this kingdom delay. Uh, let's finish up with the last verses. So Daniel's you know, told that ultimately judgment is going to be passed in favor of the saints, but they're going to have to wait. They're going to have to endure through it. And they're even going to die. Um, but... As we read earlier, there's a hope of resurrection. Judgments passed from the Ancient of Days for the saints of the Highest One. So the Most High is, uh, I believe they're the Son of Man. He's called the Most High, distinguished from the Ancient of Days. And they take possession of the kingdom. You know, there's lots of places in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, that the judgments passed. Don't you know that saints will judge the world? Why are you suing each other? You know, Paul talks of, So he brings in very... Uh, practical things, but from, you know, theology like Daniel 7. Where did you get the idea that saints were going to judge the world? Well, probably here where they're seen as participating in the judgment of the world. So he says, well, then it's not appropriate to sue one another, you know, in, the, in that context, to take each other before unbelieving law courts that are of an unbelieving world system. Not that it's never appropriate to use the civil functions. It's just in Paul's Corinthian context, he says, what the, you know, what the heck is going on? You know, so he applies that theology that, that his theology is very Christ-centered. It, it, it's centered around, uh, oriented around exalting Christ uh, in, in all aspects down to very specific situations. Let me read a verse uh, 23 and following. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different from all other kingdoms, it will devour the whole earth and tread on it and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, another will arise after them, and he will be different from all previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alterations in time and in law, 
and they will be given into his hand for time, times, and half a time. It's probably three and a half years. Time, times, plural, half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. That will be the end of all forces that rise up against God. Verse 27, Then sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms on the whole earth will be given to the people of the saints, of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. The last thing, so the saints are given the kingdom, and then it goes back to individual language. His kingdom, the saints are the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. Just like the previous kingdom will be destroyed forever, now the reign of the, uh, the Son of Man will exist forever, will continue forever. It will be an everlasting kingdom, and everyone will come and serve, worship, and obey him. But he is going to wear down the saints. It is going to be a time of exile in a world in which the saints do not belong uh, until this vision. And, uh, I mean, this world ruler is going to try to uh, receive power and authority only appropriate for God, which lots of world rulers do. But he will be so unique in it that he will establish himself basically as God, as a, a secular form of God, in a sense, that he will try to undo all other forms of worship and will try to orient it around himself and will blaspheme the Most High. He'll blaspheme uh, the, the Son of Man and will speak out directly against God. And we've heard people do that. We've heard, you know, we've all been on the internet. We've seen, but this will be someone with this uh, immense power doing so with the full force of, of this kingdom behind him. He'll be destroyed very quickly, but it's going to be at a time where he's wearing down the saints. Um, and so how does Daniel end this? Verse 28, <clears throat> at this point, the revelation ended. There we go. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. So Daniel had this vision for a while, back before Belshazzar is removed from the throne. Um, he, he puts it here strategically later. He, he aligns his book, says, okay, but now I had this vision, and this is the one that's uh, the most important, and it's also the one that's still in Aramaic. So this is a, this is a message to the nations as well whether they would heed it or not. This is a message to all kings and nations that, look, this is, this is really who's going to rule. No matter who tries to be in charge, uh, really the one like a son of man is going to be given ultimate dominion, ultimate kingdom, ultimate authority. And then between then and now, the saints will participate in suffering. They will be under foreign rulers. So I think Paul pulls in a bunch of similar terms, and even like Romans 13, uh, which I think is a, a go-to, I'll say, without nuance a lot of times. People go to as, well, you know, what do you think of that? Oh, Romans 13. Well, okay, there's a little more to it there. It's that he uses words like authority, kingdom, dominion, you know, things that are from Daniel that talk about, hey, we're in exile under a foreign rulership, that the civil magistrate has a certain function, that's, that's there from God, and we're to live under that in exile, in a, you know, in a certain way. Um, that there's, you know, like Daniel. Daniel didn't resist. Daniel didn't take up arms against Babylon. He might have had a, arguably a, a human right to do so. They're, they're threatening him. They're threatening his religious liberty. All this stuff. He doesn't do it. You know, so there, Paul's saying the same thing. Christianity is a revolutionary religion in the sense that we only acknowledge one king, we only acknowledge Christ, we only acknowledge his law as the highest law. And when it comes down to obey God or obey man, we're going to obey God, you know, God giving us grace to do that. Um, 
That being said, our goal is not to, so we live in open subversion. We say, look, we have ultimate loyalties to someone else, um, which, you know, can even be dangerous politically. For us, we have a situation where right now it's not, but, uh, you know, that, that is a very political act, but it's not to say we, you know, overthrow the system, um, you know, or that it's not to say, okay, what's the right amount of resistance or not? That's a different discussion for a different time. But uh, that we recognize that the system we're under right now is one of exile in looking forward to and anticipating this event. But there's a lot of things that we can do uh, now that um, we get to enjoy this event even before it comes. Fellowship together, word, we're Gentiles who believe in the Jewish Messiah. Uh, you know, even our gathering together, when we can gather together. Um, I, I was even thinking about today. Uh, prayer is a t kind of a chance where we get to leave this world, exit this system, and for a little while at least get to, you know, just be with God and not have to have all that stuff of this world system kind of bringing us down. You know, so it's all this is like great, hopeful uh, stuff, but it's just understanding, okay, whatever it is that we're going through right now should make us long for uh, this event. Anyway, so let's, let's end it there, and then we'll, we'll talk about some of these things um, and discuss some of these things together. But let's uh, end with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for just this work uh, that you've given us in the Son of Man, um, and Daniel's recording of these things. Lord, we pray that as we are in the present time, that like Daniel and his example and like his friends, that we will be uh, faithful as your saints, that we will be committed to be faithful to you even, even unto death, if that comes uh, to be the case, Lord, just like they were, because we hope in uh, Christ, we hope in a resurrection, uh, we hope in the knowledge of his coming kingdom and we know that those things uh, are just a matter of time away from uh, being a reality on earth so lord we pray that you'll help us to reorient our mind that you'll help us to think creatively about how to uh, apply these things to ourselves In jesus name we pray amen